TJ, we are moving up in this world. Just always recording. Series number two. Yeah, what was what was the first series? Bibliology. Bibliology. So what do we got now? We got another another series. Did did we hear enough good feedback from the first one that we thought it was worth doing again? Yeah, I think. Well, let me explain what's going on with the feedback here. TJ gets feedback, <laughs> and it's like people are just getting called into the Lord's kingdom. You know, uh, I get the feedback. It's like you need to turn off your mic. Well, you just have better <laughs> friends than I do because your friends are so honest with you. That they tell you things. My friends are just like, oh, good job, man. We really like it. I mean, I'm sure they're not even listening to it, but at least your friends are giving you constructive feedback. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do think that's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, before we get started, we do want to say thank you for everybody that's been listening. Uh, thank you for the feedback and the responses that uh, uh, we've uh, received from you guys. It's been a huge encouragement uh, just to keep working through uh, this podcast and trying to get more and more uh, material uh, out there um, to hopefully just try and clarify uh, what the Bible teaches um, and, and how to apply those things yeah. to our yeah because this is really fun and great and beneficial for us but we um, just we, we like to be encouraged it's encouraging to know that other people have benefited and have reaped some of the, the labor we put into it yeah. because we get to reap that all the time every time we sit down to discuss something um, so that's that's really cool to do yeah well, we want to welcome you back to the Reformed Informants this is a podcast devoted to biblical ex- exposition systematic theology and practical application for the good of the church uh, I'm Lance Burroughs and right next to me as always is TJ Darty and Oh, we're the reformed informants. Man, we got a big time segue yeah. from bibliology yeah. into theology proper. So, yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna start talking theology proper, um, defining who God is according to Scripture. We don't know exactly how many episodes this will be. I think we want to keep it around maybe a handful, mm-hmm. four or five, like we did with bibliology. Um, because we could easily have 25 episodes if we really <laughs> dug into it, but it wouldn't do justice if we only did it in one or two. Yeah, and, and some of the things that we leave out um, are probably left out on purpose with the intent of coming back at a later time and doing a standalone mm-hmm. episode. Um, yeah, to really yeah. dig into a particular doctrine that could bog you down when you're trying to move through systematic theology, but could actually be beneficial to look at separately. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's yeah. good. Well, in prep for beginning theology proper, we were thumbing through some systematic theologies just to see what direction they went and how they kind of navigated their way into an entry point. And we came across a quote by R.L. Dabney, a 19th century Presbyterian pastor here in in the States, actually in Virginia. And I, of course, can't say it like this, and I didn't come across (laughs) any material uh, that was said this way, but basically he is connecting and tying together bibliology and theology proper. And just a little caveat here with R.L. Dabney. Some have said that he could be considered really the greatest American theologian up there with Jonathan Edwards. I mean, I've, I've heard That's people say that. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the marks or I don't know, one of the knocks on his ministry is that he was actually pro slavery. Mm. Uh, so yeah, we acknowledge that there was a blind spot yeah. in his life. Um, but we don't want that to fully discredit some of the monumental That's works right. that he, he gave to the church. That's right. And I think we're doing an episode here coming up on church history yeah and we may even revisit you know that might be helpful may revisit this um during that episode here in a couple weeks but um this is somewhat of a lengthy quote we'll break it up here and talk about it but arl dabney he, he said these words in the 19th century he said the first question is concerning the inspiration of the scriptures well, that's where we started. That's that's exactly where we started. So he goes on and he says, This having been settled, we may proceed to assume them as inspired and infallible. I think that is that speaks to the progression that we walked through, right? Like we went revelation, inspiration, the corollary of inerrancy, those types of uh the linear thinking that comes through developing a bibliology. Yeah, 
right? Yeah, that was good. I, I think you, even personally speaking, like you, you connecting all of those dots and following that particular order was even beneficial for me. Uh, Dabney goes on, our business now is merely to ascertain and collect their teachings, to systematize them, and to show their relation to each other. So you can see here, he, his main focus is not anything outside of the scripture, but yeah, yeah. Th- yeah the scripture itself. Yeah, and I, I love the, the way that he says that, to collect their teachings and to systematize and to show their relation to each other. That's what systematic theology is. He says, we have looked at the source of theology and now let us actually systematize. Let us develop a theology from the scriptures, yeah, right? right. Like that, that's what he's attempting to do with that statement. Yeah. yeah. So back to the quote, and he goes on to say, the task of the student of revealed theology or the task of the student of theology, systematic theology, is therefore, in the first place, mainly exegetical. So TJ touched on that in our uh, episode on the prosperity gospel. We want to read what the scripture has and draw out mm. what what the text says. That's right. So Dabney goes on, having discovered the teachings of Revelation by sound exposition and having arranged them, he is to add nothing except what flows by good and necessary consequence. So what does he mean by that at, well, at the end of his quote? Yeah, the, the teachings of Revelation, which we would argue, as we discussed earlier, this is special revelation, the Word of God, by sound exposition, which we discussed in our episode on hermeneutics, the process of interpreting and understanding what uh, the Bible actually means, and having arranged them. We talked about how to do theology, a theological endeavor. So we've attempted to do all of these things. And then Dabney ends by saying he used to add nothing except what flows by good and necessary consequence. In other words, now there's a logical and cohesive order to our theological structure, and we pull it from Scripture. We take nothing and add to it, um, We, but we have to deal with everything that is actually there. And so we're going to um, address all that the Bible says and build a system that logically flows from it. And so naturally, taking that quote, where, where are we going to flow into next? Yeah. Flowing from the scriptures right into theology proper. I mean, I can't. I'm almost nervous starting a study on God. It's intimidating. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot. Okay. Oh man. Help help us out. I, I want us to make sure that we're defining our terms. We talk about theology all the time. We use that word theology. Uh, that's part of our even our introduction. We we're devoted as a podcast to. Uh, biblical exposition and systematic theology. Why do you why are you tackling or attacking this word proper on at the end of what is theology proper? Yeah, I thought all we were doing is theology. Yeah, what it is all we're doing it, 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 theology. We are doing theology, but we want to add proper onto that as, as a way of categorizing our approach to studying God. Okay. Um, and what I would mean by that is we're, we're not necessarily looking at philosophical arguments for God. Um, but we're going directly to the scripture to see how the scripture reveals this God. Yes. And what would you add to that? Yeah. And and I think just even from the systematic theologian perspective, theology proper gives us a way of distinguishing to say, this is a study of God himself, whereas all theology is related to God. Right. But when we say theology proper, we are narrowing in not just on like Christology or the study of Christ is a part of theology, yeah. but theology proper is a study of God himself, right? So it kind of distinguishes between those two, yeah. right? Like when you say that that kind of helps us no, yeah, distinguish that, those? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it does. It takes it from a, a little broad right. understanding to more narrow down to right. a specific or a category. Exactly. So we just did a study of the Bible, bibliology. Now we are transitioning into theology proper, which is the study of God, which is a monumental task in and of itself. We're going to try uh, and climb this mountain. That's right. But 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 we have to, do we not? Because that's, that's what, and even Dabney's quote there, um, it, it, this comes from the scriptures. This is d- having discovered the teachings of revelation by sound exposition. Well, what? how does the Bible even begin? In the beginning, God. Who is this God? 
right? Like that's our task as we jump into theology proper. Uh, this is so important. So of course, <laughs> this is so important. Lawson has said multiple times, "You tell me what you believe about God, and I will tell you everything about your life or what flows out of your life." Like if you tell me and and give me a, a biblical understanding of God then I'll be able to determine and know what the rest of your life is is like. So he he makes the argument for the importance and the urgency of knowing a biblical God. You still thinking about that quote where I jacked (laughs) this? I I could not. I was not sure I was going to hold it in. I was trying to let you make your point, but I was scared to death you were going to butcher that quote like you did the D.A. Carson one. As I was talking about Lawson (laughs) here, I'm looking at T.J., Oh right in the eye. I thought I was going to exactly lose Exactly what he's thinking. Oh my! God. I didn't want to ruin your thought. Um, in fact, you might. Uh, uh, let me repeat kind of the the message of what you were saying, because you're right. How we view God will determine the way we live. If we have a small view of God, or a God who does not uh, care, or if, if we have a God who has there's no eternal consequences. If this life is all there is, then why would I not pursue hedonism? Why would I not maximize pleasure in this life? Um, if my view of God is that he is, um, a rigid, uh, strict father that has no or rigid and strict judge who has no leniency whatsoever, I will, that will sh- show up in the way I live. And so I, I, I think your point stands and kudos on nailing the quote because that was really i was nervous for you so good oh man good i'm glad you had my back there of course all right so now now that now that we've gotten through um because you weren't reading that quote the first the dabney quote you were reading i felt pretty good about but you were you were going with the lawson quote from memory so i was a little nervous yeah well Um, i I, no, i do i love how lawson says that because it puts it in perspective on Look, there, there's no greater subject, there's no greater mm. task, there, there, there's no greater thought um, than, than thinking of God. A.W. Tozer, in his book, Knowledge of the Holy, he, he, he starts that book by, by talking about, look, what you think about God is essentially the most important thing about you. Mm. Like, uh, I mean, again, there's, there, there's no greater subject, there's no greater task than talking and thinking and meditating upon God. And, and we've said before... And we said early on that everyone is a theologian, right? Like everybody has to do this in some capacity. Now, not everybody opens up their Bibles and studies the way that we want to encourage um, our listeners to and the way that we want to. But everybody has to have a view of God in some capacity. Um, There's no escaping it, whether you reject that, um, the the existence of God or not, you you have a view and and you've developed a, a theology in that way. So... It's incredibly important, and it's something that everybody has to do. Um, so, to, yeah, to, to launch into that, where do you, where do you where do we go first? Yeah, well, I think quickly here we can establish some difficulties that come about when you do approach a study of God. Okay, so uh, th- there are some roadblocks, I would say, uh, that would be in front of us as we make this approach up the mountain, um, and regards to studying the nature, the character, and the, the attributes of God. Um, one of those, I would say, is that God is just incomprehensible. And what I mean by that is we cannot know the full depths of God. We, we, we can't know the full depths of God because we're not God. And this is what makes God God. Uh, didn't you quote, you quoted from Sproul, Sproul right. in a previous episode on that. Um, I got the quote right too. He did. He did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let me let me ask this: If God is incomprehensible, and I can't fully understand God, why do I even try? Well, we we want to try because First Corinthians chapter two says that the Spirit of God knows the deep things of God, mm. and that He has revealed those things. That's really good. Um, it, we have the mind of Christ. I think that passage ends in First Corinthians chapter two. That's so. Right. Look, even though God is incomprehensible in his full blazing glory, we do have a revelation of God that has there, been revealed in a way to know him. There it is. That's that's exactly right. Man, I'm so glad you said that. But that's we have this revelation. We have what God has given to us. He has revealed himself. And so even though the full revelation of God has not been made manifest, 
the revelation that we do have, because he is incomprehensible for a finite mind, for a finite being such as us. Uh, But he has given us a revelation both through the person of Christ, but also in his written word. And that revelation gives us a picture and a, a, a way to actually understand who he is. And so we have a responsibility and obligation. That was, man, that was so good. I'm so glad um, because I wasn't even, I was ready to go on to the next point. Um, and, and you brought us back where we need to be. And that's that re- God has revealed himself. So even though he is incomprehensible, there is revelation and there is access to him. Right. So that's really good. Uh, what, what else? What other difficulties yeah, do we face? Yeah. Another difficulty I would add is that God is not like us. We are so prone to make God like us or to make God in our image. Mm. But but the Bible clearly portrays God as not being like us. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man. Yeah. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 21, God says, you thought that I was just like you, mm. right? So the scriptures demonstrate clearly that God is not like us. So that just brings difficulty within itself on trying to understand and know this God when, in in one sense of the word, it, it is foreign to us. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, another verse that comes to mind, Romans 11, classic text, um, where Paul says at the end of his um, discussion from Romans 9 to 11, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how unscrutable, inscrutable his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor. I mean, that's what, what, what does he say to Job? Where were you, Job, whenever I created the heavens? Where, where were you when I established this earth? Yeah, poor old Job, he got a rude <laughs> awakening there. Right. But the but the point I think really comes through there, and, and the same thing is in Isaiah. Um, we see that same concept. But is it Isaiah fifty five where where you see the same language used? Um, don't quote me on that. I have to check. We're talking about my thoughts are higher yes. and greater. Yeah, those yes. things. Isaiah fifty five. And so yeah. so you have this. God himself is not, he is above, he is beyond, he's, he's greater than we are. And so there is a, there's a natural disconnect and it makes it difficult in a sense, whereas I don't have the experience of being God. So I can't really, there's, there's a, a, a logical deficiency in me being able to understand right. something that's beyond yeah. me. Okay. So l- let me ask you about another difficulty. And I, I think you'll be able to answer this one better than me. That's why I get to ask here. <laughs> So regarding language, why is human language, why, why is there some difficulty in truly understanding God based on everyday language that we would use? Or, or is that a problem, or is it not a problem? Uh, well, thanks for this question, because it's not easy. <laughs> um, but, but language language is a, a way in which we are able to communicate on a human level, okay, right? Like it's there are there are things that are above there are things that are above us that can't be expressed or communicated in in language. Like that's what makes them beyond understanding is that there's no way to capture them with language. Um, it, it, you think about I wish I understood or had more vocabulary to express the greatness of God, but we have limitations. Okay, yeah, right? that, that's where I was hoping yeah. you would go with yeah. that. Is that a, we've already demonstrated that God is not like us; He's not like man. Mm-hmm. Okay, but He has given us language, and He has revealed Himself in languages. And uh, again, getting the full scope and understanding of God. Uh, ultimately is not going to be reached because of the level right. of communication or the level right. of terminology or even, you know, to say God is a amazing and wonderful God. Okay, well, yeah. I, I, those are some of the best words that I know. Right. I, I wish I could express that better. Right. But the, the, you're, the, that's a great example. There's a limitation. There's a shortcoming. And in fact, the only reason why we even have any way to communicate about God is because God has lowered himself or made himself available through human language. Yeah. He has revealed himself in a way in which we can understand. I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, uh, but the way Calvin 
calls this kind of like a divine baby talk. Like God is now the baby spe- talk. He's, he's like speak the way that when when our little ones come into this world very soon. Um, you know, we're we're weeks away now. It's it's incredible. Uh, but when they come into this world and they're learning language, they won't be able to understand full syntactical, grammatical, you know, structured sentences. But we will make noises and sounds, and they can communicate in the most basic way. And a lot of uh, ways that parallels the way God communicates with us. It's not a full representation of how God would communicate about himself, but he has made it as such that we can understand something and language gives us a tool to do that, but it's a limited tool to do that. Right. So any yeah. other difficulties that we can think of that we need to discuss? Um, I, yeah, there's plenty, <laughs> there's plenty of difficulties in trying to grasp, um, and understand who God is. Um, I guess the, the last one that comes to mind is we're, we are attempting to build a system or a structure to evaluate and understand who God is? Like, how would you, yeah, how would well, you kind even of build an exa- off of that? Yeah, an example of that, when we get into the attributes of God next episode, even trying to break down the attributes of God into specific categories has shown some difficulties throughout the centuries. Mm-hmm. You, again, you could, uh, you know, flip through a dozen systematic theologies and the approach to organizing even God's attributes is um, different uh, amongst those uh, textbooks. Yeah, there, if you've um, got 12 systematic theologies, you've probably got 12 approaches to... Yeah. Uh, and how, how, do we, how do we start with one attribute and not another? How do we develop and highlight one um, part of God's um, character and nature while simultaneously neglecting others yeah. you know and there's just difficulties in that that's, right there, we, we get there's that there's shortcomings there's no perfect way to do that so i think that's a, a good reminder for us um so despite those shortcomings despite those difficulties and the task the monumental task that we have ahead of us let's start by just attempting to make some sense of the being of god yeah okay like there's there's been debate through systematic and there are reasons why different theologians start different places we could start with the trinity uh and speak of god as three in one uh, but before we even get into the the discussions related to the trinity which will have to be a separate episode let's just talk about the being of god who who god is um and where would you take us if we're, if we're going to start discussing there yeah, I think the route that I would go would be the names of God. If we understand uh, names of God that come across the pages of Scripture, the names of God define God. Okay. Right? The names of God define God. So there you, were you're cus- saying it's not just a label that's attached to, like it's not just an arbitrary term that's thrown onto his name like the way that we call you lance or me tj right it's not just god's name yeah you're saying there's something deeper yeah yeah, there's within the the multiple names that are given or or, are shown in scripture of god they they all mean something they all define his nature they define his his character Mm -hmm. um they define who he is um Mm. so uh, again just prepping for this episode running through those systematic theologies, I would say this would be the overwhelming start mm-hmm. by a, a majority yeah. of them uh, d- defining the names of God. Well, it's a natural place to start because when you start to consider who God is, well, first of all, what do you mean by who God is? What do you mean with, with that label? Where does that come from? Why, are, why, do you, why do we even call him God? Well, what, what what does that mean? Where does that come from? So so yeah, let's let's talk about those names because again, it's not just an arbitrary word that is attached to designate. Hey, this is a being that we need to acknowledge, and we don't have a better word to describe him. Rather, the names, especially in those original languages, um, give us a picture and a depiction of part of who he is, as you mentioned, that is part of his being. So, okay, first moniker first label name description that comes to mind when you think of the old testament uh, i think you have to go yahweh you have to go yahweh and i think you start here because this is the name of god that is used the most in in the old testament in it's, other words yeah. 
almost 7,000 times, almost 7,000 times, God is called, referred to as Yahweh. But it's not the first name that's given to him. No. Right? Like, in, if you're reading through the Bible, where where does this actually appear first? Where do we first see this actually show up? Yeah, the first time this is given is by God himself. Mm, God himself right. reveals his own personal name. That's right? that's a really good point. This is not Moses writing about God to the reader going, oh, okay, well, this is, this is Yahweh. That's who he's talking about. But rather, as you said... God tells Moses that that's who he is. Yeah, and, and, and that is critical. Moses isn't just making up this name. In other words, he's not bored in the wilderness. He's not hanging exactly. up on Mount Sinai. We have um, God who is manifesting himself, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but God is manifesting himself in the burning bush. He is talking back and forth with Moses and then he identifies himself um, for the for the first time, mm. Yahweh. Mm. What does Yahweh mean? Now, why, why does he give himself that moniker, that name? Well, uh, yeah, I think God Himself uh, in Exodus three verse fourteen he, he he defines it in a couple ways. God says to Moses, "This is Exodus three fourteen. I am who I am." Okay, so uh, I think he is. God is saying, "Look, I am." <laughs> I am. Yeah. Now there's a lot to unpack in that. I mean, that is a loaded. Yes. It's a serious statement when God makes that. And it's not just a, oh, really? You couldn't have picked a better name for yourself? (laughs) Like, I am who I am. Where is the creativity? (laughs) I mean, how long do we spend trying to come up with names for our. Right. Right. Yeah. Babies coming out here in the fall. You couldn't, you couldn't come up with anything better than that. Like that's like, I am who I am. Like it almost kind of seems default. But that's not. Re- there's more theological uh, punch that's packed into that, and in fact, the root of this Hebrew word that we we describe or, or transliterate as Yahweh um, actually comes from the the root in in the Hebrew means I am. It's the 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 verb to be. And God claims that verb and says, that describes me. Yeah. Like that, is, I just am. And so there's an eternality that is attached to that. There is. Verse 15, Exodus 3. This is my name forever. Hmm. Right? Yes. And, and so there's, it's not, I was, I will be, it's I am. He's continually is. He always is. He always is present. He always is. Um, he's eternally himself. That, that's that's part of the nature of God himself. He is e- eternal, and he's eternally um, characterized by being God. Yeah, I think this is a plug back to the Bible translation episode that we did, mm-hmm. talking about the English translation of the Bible is a good and accurate translation of the original text all the way down to the tenses of words. Because if you have a tense that's off here in Exodus 3.14, Exodus 3.15, now you've got a, you have an issue with the character that's and the right. nature of God. That's right. Not he was, right. you know, I right. am. And, and of course, this is echoed by Jesus in the New Testament, right? Like he, when he makes that claim, he says, before Abraham was, I am. What he is doing is he's equating himself with God himself in Exodus 3. That's a a direct claim to say, I am God. That's what he means when he says that. So anybody who says, oh, Jesus didn't claim to be God, that's just nonsense. Well, that's why the Jews picked up stones to to stone him. They knew exactly what he was doing. That's right. You didn't just casually walk around and go, hey, I am. Like that, you would never do that because that was to claim divinity, and that's what Jesus is doing here. He uh, in in the Gospel of John, and it's a reference back to this statement by God, who uh, makes the claim and makes the statement. And he says, "I am." It's a a it's an expression of his eternality, of his essence, of his being. Okay, so let me ask you something, TJ. I, I've read the Old Testament, and I just don't see Yahweh anywhere as far as the name of God showing up in Scripture. Have you been reading it in English? I have been that's, reading well, it in English. Well, that's your first okay. problem. Okay. That's your first problem. If you so, read so, it in Hebrew. Okay, so when there. we say Yahweh, 
Y A H W E H Yahweh. Why why don't I see why why don't I see that in my English Bible? I, I could flip through here again mm-hmm. almost seven thousand times. I'm not seeing it. What's the deal? Well, most of the time in our English translations, you're gonna see God or Lord translated regard even though there are multiple words in the original the uh, Hebrew language, there are multiple words that might be used underneath. The translators recognize, hey, this means God, this means Lord. They translate it because that's the way that the text flows into English. But with Yahweh, almost every translation does something to distinguish that. And so most of the time in the Old Testament, you'll see the all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps, Lord. And that all caps is a reference to this word Yahweh. And part of the reason why they do that, of course, is to distinguish it from the others. But that, that name that God gives himself was so highly revered that even the early Jewish scribes and rabbis, they wouldn't pronounce it. They wouldn't even say it. They wouldn't it. say it. They would, when they got to that, um, that word, as they were reading the text, they would say Adonai instead, which is another word that means Lord. Yeah, right. And so then, then they put vowel pointings because Hebrew doesn't have vowels naturally, and so they added vowels for people who were learning the language. But they, they put the vowel pointings as the vowels from Adonai onto the the word Yahweh yeah. so that they wouldn't say it. Right. They didn't want to say it because it was so highly revered, because it was so much of a distinction. We've talked before about God's holiness, right? Like, what does it mean to be holy? Set apart, distinct from... And God is so holy, and that name is so distinct and so set apart that they wouldn't even say it. Yeah, so that that name, when it was said, it held so much weight Mm. and so much value that there was almost a limitation to even saying that because of his pureness Mm -hmm. and his his holiness. And I, I do think, and it's one of the things I like about the English translation of the Scripture, is they've captured that by... Kind of, kind of extending that Jewish tradition by not placing Yahweh in there, but using Lord. Right. Um, right. Now, uh, another, but all caps, Lord. All, ca- all caps. Yeah. yeah all caps. Um, and another th- interesting thing that I think we should note or mention with Yahweh is, is the word Jehovah. Mm-hmm. What, it, what have it, you it, uncovered when you studied? So yeah. that connection. Yeah, the, the word Jehovah essentially comes from the Latin translation of the Hebrew. And just like TJ had talked about, uh, Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So the vowels from Adonai were added into Yahweh. Essentially, the same thing was done in Latin with Yahweh. And that's where we get Jehovah. Mm-hmm. Um, Jehovah. So again, those references that you will see in your Old Testament... Um, that, that come across as Jehovah, that's also, th- this is the I am. This is right. the Yahweh that we're talking about here. Well, that yeah, so that word Jehovah, if you just look at the vowel, I mean, so you, if you just look at the consonants, it's J-H-V-H, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, Y-H-W-H, when you actually transliterate, there is no sound in the Hebrew of a J or a W. Uh, excuse me, a Y or W, like the J is equated to the Y, the W is equated to the V, and so you have Jehovah, which is a, a echo of Yahweh. It's okay. the same ones, like like Yeshua is Joshua, um, Ys and Js were interchangeable, so it's just a, a spelling and, and um, transliteration issue there, but you see those same four consonants repeated um, and parallel between Yahweh and Jehovah. Okay, so will we say that the vowels in this case and in many other cases, the vowels were added to be able to pronounce Mm -hmm. those particular words? Now, Mm -hmm. is there some controversy on how to say those words exactly in the original languages? Or am am I I just making that up? Because I think I've heard or read something about the difficulty in saying some of those Hebrew words because it was consonants only. Yes. But vowels were, you know, essentially placed in the margins. Yes. Or and above or below the they words. They were typically placed below the words. So we, even if you learn Hebrew today, biblical Hebrew today, that's where the vowels are. It's just the consonants and the vowels are placed underneath those consonants. And those were added for non-Hebrew speakers to be able to understand 
how the flow of the word is. Okay, so it was a preservation technique, yes, maybe? and the scribes added that much later. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting development in those um, in, in those biblical texts so that the words might be able to be produced. But the point, I think, that we've made with this is to show that the names and the words there are so reverent and they're so important. Like, that's it's not an accident. It's not arbitrary it's intentional because the word means something uh, the these names mean something and they say something about who God is about who God is right and 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 you think about like I I love that we went to Exodus 3 because that's where God actually reveals the source of Yahweh the the source of I am there there are other places even prior to this in Exodus and and even in Genesis I believe where you're gonna see those that, that word used, but this is a revelation. God is now saying, this is what I mean when I say Yahweh. I mean, I am. So I think it's important when you see it 7,000 times to depict who God is, that's what he's speaking of. Yeah, and there was a validation. And I'll just insert this here and then we can, we can move on. But there was a validation of this name when Moses goes back to the people He lets them know, look, I just had a conversation with I am, Mm. and then he has the ability to perform three supernatural signs (laughs) in order to verify that exact conversation. So again, Moses isn't just coming up with this. He's not making up a conversation. He verifies um, that this conversation actually took place in a burning bush. Right. God's name is revealed right. uh, by being able to turn the staff into a serpent, a, a withered hand essentially mm-hmm. could be healed, mm-hmm. and then uh, the third one, uh, turning water to blood, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so anyways, we just have a lot of validation around God's name, I am, right. Yahweh, Jehovah. That's right. Okay, but that's not the only name that God has in the Old Testament. Um, what, what other common name do we see? I mean, there are so many names because in Hebrew, it's very easy to take one part of God's name, attach it to a part of who he is or what he has done. And now you can say he is God, the deliverer. He is God, the preserver. He is God, the almighty. You can, you can attach these adjectives to his name and depict him and, and, and highlight a particular um, component or essence of his person, of his being, or of his activity. But what other names do we see frequently used in the Old Testament to depict who God is? Well, in the beginning, God, right? Yeah, you just mentioned, at least in passing there, Psalm sixty-eight twenty. God is to us a God of deliverances. Mm-hmm. So you were talking about different things being mm-hmm. attached uh, to God. Um, Elohim, okay. God, mm-hmm. okay? We would say that Elohim or God is essentially differentiating God as far as being the one true God of power, strength, and might. Um, Again, we see that in Psalm chapter 68. Uh, This shows up, I mean, dozens and dozens and hundreds of Mm -hmm. times in in, in the Old Testament. Yeah, and that word, um, gosh, I'm I'm embarrassed that I didn't look this up before, so tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe, based on my memory of, of Hebrew, that this word is actually in the plural, um, yeah. that Elohim is, is is in the plural, and, and you, it may speak somewhat to the Trinity, but really what it is is a, it's a, uh, an emphatic, it's a way to highlight this is the the God of gods, like he is, he is above, over, and, uh, and supreme over others. And there's no one before or right. after this God. Right, so the, it's not just like he Isaiah is a says. God, he's not just a God, he is the God. And so there's such an emphasis um, and an emphatic way of, of saying this in the uh, Hebrew language. So glad, by the way, that I didn't mess that up whenever I said he was... Um, <laughs> I that, can't that ridicule you. <laughs> ridicule you all episode well now. yeah we would have edited that out no question no but that, um, that is true the, the statement that you just made if you go back and read uh, isaiah in, in particular the 40s uh, chapter 40 mm-hmm. for, through 49 there's an extreme emphasis by isaiah on god being above all gods mm-hmm. god being before every god god being after every god i, I think it's almost highlighted there greater may, maybe than anywhere in the old testament um, th- this idea of God being all-powerful, God superseding any other of the yeah. 
pantheon of gods. Right. And, and that's what the, the, the term Elohim means. It is, it's the God of power, strength, and might. Like that's, that's who God is, and it is captured even in the language of what the term itself is. Like I, I think that that is part of the reason that language and the names of God matter so much yeah. because it depicts that part of his being, that, that part of his essence. As we try to put together an understanding of who God is. All right, give me another one. What do we got next, TJ? Uh, man, the 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 next phrase or, or term that you see frequently in Scripture is that of Adonai, um, which is we've referenced before. This is the the term which the vow points were used in in place of the actual vows of Yahweh, um, because Yahweh doesn't really have vows, mm-hmm. um, but Adonai did in this pronunciation, and so th- this word. Is it's a it's distinct from Yahweh, but it still has the same English translation, and that is one of of Lord. Yeah, so I think it's we need to recognize that we need to be aware of that. Mm-hmm. That reading through the Old Testament, you you will see both, and I, mm-hmm. it, man, it's such a benefit to understand that there is both and why there is both. Yeah, and it, and let us also be clear that when the Old Testament uses Adonai, it's not a secondary yeah. use uh, yeah. right like like we talked Just about default to lowercase right. you know right. ORD here exactly like oh this is this is not highlighting the greatness of the eternality of God like that's that's not to do it's it's Yahweh Elohim the other the other names that we aren't going to get into just because we don't have time. But then Adonai, it's not saying, Oh, one is more important than the other. Some of it is, some of it is authorial choice. There's freedom in that. Um, but some of it is emphasizing just different aspects of his character. It's emphasizing That's why the names are important. It's right. Like they, they carry something else to it and it's not de-emphasizing anything else. To use Adonai is not to say God is not eternal. Like that's not, it's not taken away. It's it's instead just a a reference to the fact that he is the Lord. He is the master. He is we are the doulos in the Greek, right? Like we are the slaves. He is the Adonai in the Hebrew, the the Lord. He is the one who is above um, and, and has this supreme authority over us, right. over humanity, over his creation. Yeah, Lord, he's he's master, he's king, he's owner, he's sovereign, he's supreme. And it's key that we see God in this way also because Isaiah chapter 53, when it talks about the suffering servant, mm. it talks about uh, the slave, and, which is a picture of Christ. So we, we even see this relationship between God and Christ unfolding in Old Testament prophecies. Um, with with the the title Lord, that's really good. Um, and just another by way of comparison, we also see in the Old Testament multiple times, New Testament as well, that God is called Father. Mm-hmm. Again, the idea of God being called Father doesn't somehow restrict His attributes, you know, demote His deity. Mm-hmm. But it's just another aspect. I mean, again, we're we're talking about God here, right? Right. I mean, it, it's a never ending study of who He is. Thankfully. We have multiple names for this one true God because it is defining and opening up his character, his nature, his being, his essence. This is super helpful. And no amount of names or adjectives or descriptions could ever fully capture this is the limitation component coming back into play. We could never have enough uh, descriptions or or true names to, to really capture who God is. But these are the ones that God has chosen to reveal himself as he's used these names in his revelation to say this captures as best you can understand your human finite language and understanding who I am. And that that father component is so critical. Um, it, it's so important for us to see that this is how God has chosen to depict himself. And we see that, like you mentioned, Old Testament even more fully in the New Testament as we understand the relationship of the Trinity because you have the Father and the Son um, together as part of the the triune Godhead. But even in the Old Testament, you see the language of God as Father. Yeah, John 17, high priestly prayer, Mm -hmm. Jesus addresses God as Father. Mm Mm-hmm. It's intimate. Yes. And that's one of the aspects of God that 
we just love. Yeah. Right. The, the one true God is a, a father. Right. We can refer to him as father. And yeah. we see Jesus Christ as the best example of doing that. Right. Matthew six, same thing, right? Like our father who are in heaven. Like that's, that's how he comes to him. Uh, Romans eight, Paul talks about, we have a father our, who we, whom we cry out, Abba, father. Like that's our, the relationship that, that God has with not only Jesus Christ, but also with those who have been adopted as his sons and daughters in yeah, Christ. Yeah. Like there's that, there's the familial relationship. There's the loving care. I mean, Jesus says you are earthly fathers and you give wicked gifts to your children. How much more would your heavenly father love and give you good gifts? Like this is part of who God is. He is a loving father. Um, and he has uh, established that relationship with his people because it is in addition to being eternal, in addition to being Yahweh, I am, in addition to being Elohim, this God of power, might, and strength, in addition to being Adonai, the Lord and master and king and owner, he is also a loving father over his children. Yeah, like every it, good and perfect gift comes from above. Right. The father of lights, where there's right. no variation or shadow of turning. I mean, that. It is just understood that, yeah, God is Yahweh. He is Lord. Uh, mm-hmm. He is God, but he, he is also, f- he's Father. Right. And to, and to emphasize oh, one of those that. without the other is an incomplete and inadequate yeah. view of God. Yeah. Like, we, we can't, this is, my, this is my frustration a lot of times with the American church right now, this evangelical um, trajectory where it's like, oh, God is just such a good father. Like, yeah. He is a good father, and I don't want to discount that, but don't just focus on the fact that he's a good father. He's also the supreme Lord. He's also Adonai. He's also Elohim. Like, let's not forget who he is just because we focus on one. We can't neglect the other. Right. We and have it, to have both. This is the beauty of systematic theology. Exactly, this is exactly. the beauty of surveying all of Scripture. Right. This is the beauty of biblical exposition because you expose yourself personally to the entire realm mm-hmm. of God, but even as a you know as, as a pastor, as a teacher, or someone that's administering the Word of God, you give your people now all all of God. That's right, and not just a partial aspect. That's right. Okay, we've we've spent some time, I I, I think enough time on the names. Um, we could I mean, we could do this forever. Um, where where do we go next? Um, we, we want to do a separate discussion later when we can really chew on the things we bite off regarding um, the attributes of God. I believe that will probably be the next place we go. Um, but what else do we need to look at briefly when we think about the being of God, the essence of God just in general? Yeah, I'm, I get this question all the time. It's a great question. Um, it's one that needs to be asked, and I think everybody probably has this question. What does God look like? That's easy. He's, <laughs> he's a white guy with a long beard, right? Yeah, he, uh, he has a beard just like me. Um, <laughs> Caucasian, no. <laughs> no, but but in all seriousness, like I kind of joke facetiously about that, but I don't want to be trivial when it comes to this because this is important. That depiction of God is so upside down. It's it, it so distorts who God is. And so we want to legitimately look and say, what does God look like? If I'm going to picture as I'm reading the scriptures, when I picture this God, what do I see? Who, where, what, what do I understand him to be like in his, in his look, in his appearance? Yeah, and it, it's important that we know and it's important that we think about God's appearance in this manner because to think of God in a way that isn't found in Scripture is extremely dangerous because mm-hmm. now you're thinking of God in a way that isn't revealed in Scripture. You're formulating in your mind a visible representation of God that isn't there. Right. J.I. J. Packer in Knowing God, specifically chapter 4, and I, I know that because... My students love this chapter, but is it idolatry to think of God in a form mm. or taking on some type of manifestation? Calvin deals with that in the Institutes. I don't know if that if if Packer oh, touches on the same thing. We did not get through the Institutes. <laughs> That's sad. Um, 
Maybe, maybe you, you know what I'm saying there. Yes, okay. absolutely. That's why Calvin says the exact same thing. He says if you attempt to capture or to depict through art, through sculpture, through painting, some type of image that depicts who God is, that is a very dangerous place to be because you are creating an image in the place of God because God Himself cannot be fully and adequately represented with human. Depiction. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Is that? Yeah. No, man. I, I love that. I, I get nervous sometimes. I start talking. I feel like Michael Scott. Sometimes I start <laughs> a sentence and I don't know where it's going. I just hope to find it along it's the way. Run, it's just run a mud. Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. So I'm, what I'm, God? What does God look like? Yeah, I'm gonna pull out a couple of verses here from the Gospel of John. We've got some from First Timothy that you can read next here. Well, let's develop this real quick. First off, John one. Uh, verse 18, um, it says, No one has seen God at any time. Okay, that's not a bad place to start here, okay? <laughs> so no one has seen God at any time. Over in John chapter 6, uh, verse 46, Jesus' own words, Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Okay, so Jesus demonstrates mm-hmm. th- that no one has seen the Father. Okay, now is this a roadblock, or are we now dribbling over our, you know, our own lips here? How, how do we deal with this? Well, the other passage that comes to mind is, um, and I'm not sure if you wanted to go to this later, and if you did, then forgive me. But I'm thinking of Exodus 33, um, when God appears to to Moses. And in verse 20, he says, But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That's, that's Exodus 33, verse 20. Um, and yeah. so the, the, the Lord says right after that, he says, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. In other words, God says, you cannot look on me because of the, the essence itself is so overwhelming. It's so un, it it can't even be captured and can't be seen and captivated by the human eye. Yeah. Well, yeah. Verse 18 of that same chapter, Moses is basically begging, Mm -hmm. please show me your glory. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, but but I think that's important for us to understand that you can't see God face to face. Jesus says, no one has seen the Father. The only one who has seen the Father is the one who came from the Father, which is Jesus himself. Moses, who is as close to God as any human being on the planet at the time of his life, <laughs> fair to say. he uh, Good assumption there. He doesn't, he doesn't have access to see God. Well, can anyone see God? What is how? How do we deal with that? Well, the other factor in this is that God Himself is spirit. Right. He He's He is actually invisible. Um, but to worship God in spirit and truth, John four, mm-hmm. right? Because God is spirit. Jesus right. says. Right. Um, the, First Timothy one, uh, verse seventeen. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible. The only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is invisible because he is spirit. He is uh, unable to be captured with yeah. with an image. Yeah, notice here, and this backs up to what we were talking about earlier in the episode, verse 7. Now to the king, referring to God, and then he's called the only God. So you can even see Paul is referring to God in multiple ways like we were talking about right, here. right. Exactly. And then later in the same letter, uh, Paul goes on to say in in chapter 6, he says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, again, the same type of description there, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Yeah. So you can't even see God. Well, here's my question. That, that's as difficult as that is for me to really 
I, I, I don't like that. Like I want to be able to say I can see God, right? But, but okay, if God says he's invisible, he's a spirit, um, he is unable to be seen, no one can see him. We can only see kind of, in, in Moses' case, like there's, a, there's an unveiling to a degree where we can see where he has been, his presence is made known to us, but we can't actually physically see it. But what do we do when we think about the appearance of God? The Old Testament, um, especially the Old Testament, we, we see phrases about the finger of God writing on the tablets of stone, the hand of God that, that God spoke to Moses face to face. Does God have a, a, a face? Um, there, are, there are phrases and expressions in the Hebrew which say that God is extremely merciful and literally in the Hebrew it says that he is long of nose. Uh, does God have a nose? Does it, his eyes, he sees um, with his eye over all of his creation. How do we handle those, those la- th- that language? Yeah, we need to handle it, right? Right, we, we have to. Yeah, we need to handle that correctly because if you look into Mormon theology, they will go back to those texts that talk about the hand of the Lord, the arm of the Lord, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera, mm-hmm. and they will say, well, look, it says here that God has a face, Mm -hmm. so he clearly must be a man. And Mm -hmm. their theology is basically wrapped around this idea that God is, God the Father is a a man based on uh, anthropomorphic terms, right? Mm -hmm. So, so how do we deal with that? Well, well before you answer that, I think, that, gosh, that's such a Don't good, make me say that word again. Anthropomorphic. That is really <laughs> good. Credit for you, because I'm going to make you come back and define that. But I, I loved what you just said there, and I wanted to, to plug this again, because we talked about hermeneutics before. We talked about the plain reading of the text, unless we have a reason to not read it plainly. So when I first read that, that the, the hand of God, the arm of God, my first instinct should be, okay, the hand of God, that God has a hand. But later, when I have other texts that conflict with that, I now take the clear text, which says God is invisible, because, God cannot be seen, yeah. and I interpret the more difficult text in light of that. So I know from the more clear text that we have gone through in John uh, chapter 1, chapter 6, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 6, um, Exodus 33, I've gone through and built this case. God is invisible. God can't be seen. God is spirit. Now, how do I interpret with the anthropomorphic, as you so eloquently put it? Yeah, the well, the analogy of faith, right? Scripture yes. interprets scripture. Right. You went to those clear passages. So the clear passages have been laid out. They have. So how do we explain the hand of the mm-hmm. Lord, right? H- how do we explain him looking upon? Well, again, this is one of the difficulties in studying God and using human language and human terminology to describe someone that is invisible and that is not like man. What, what we have here is the writers of Scripture that are using human language to essentially define and broaden um, the character of God, not in relation to how he looks, but how he is acting maybe towards his people. Mm -hmm. And and I think the other side of that, I think that's really important that we understand that this is more of a function of God rather than the appearance. Okay. Right. So we're we're talking action, function. we're, We're not necessarily talking about God in a Shirts and shorts. Exactly, exactly. And then the other reason why we see that, we, we've kind of touched on this earlier with this concept, as I mentioned, of Calvin's divine baby talk. We can't understand anything other than language which depicts the actual physical manifestation. So we're not creating God in our image, but in fact God is revealing himself in a way that makes sense to us. So he doesn't literally have a finger that writes on the tablets of stone in the book of Exodus. He doesn't literally write his his Ten Commandments down with his finger. But what he does is he uses language that makes sense to us that even though his finger doesn't come down, the function or the action of God is as if he did that with his own hand. It's as if he had a hand like us, that's what the result would be. So there's a distinction there between those two but it, it makes sense. It gives us a way. That's what you use that term anthropomorphic or, or anthropomorphisms. What that fancy word means is 
godlike action expressed in human terms. Yeah. So it, it's just a way for us to to see and understand God in a uh, comprehensible uh, language yeah. depiction. And, and that's the beauty of Scripture. Right. Um, that is the harmony of all of Scripture is those those issues on the surface, um, th- they can all be dealt with, God being invisible, but at the same time, we've got texts that are talking about God, yeah. I guess you could say, in, in human terminology. Yeah, exactly. Right? We, we don't, again, we don't, we don't steer clear from those passages. We, right. we don't um, beat around the bush. Right. We don't ignore them. Look, uh, the Bible's okay with them. Mm-hmm. Man, we should be confident in our explanation yeah. of those things. Uh, yeah, and, that's, and I think it gives us a more full and clear depiction of who God is. Yeah. Right? Okay, let's wrap up. We Man, we've been talking for a long time and really trying to dive into these things. Uh, where do we go? Where, how do we walk away? What, what do we chew on? Well, okay. Performance initiative. Well, before we get to that, let me let me answer one one more question here. If if we can't, if God's invisible, then what does that mean eternally in heaven, though? Ooh. You know, like you and I die today. We wrap up this episode, and that, <laughs> that is our farewell Can tour. Can we publish it first before we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let us get that uploaded first. Um, so, I mean, all this talk about God being invisible, is it going to be a massive, huge disappointment in the new heaven and new earth, Revelation 21 and 22? One word there would be no. Okay. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's a good start. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Revelation 21 and 22. What are, what are you... What what are you referencing when you when you speak of that passage? Yeah, we're talking about uh, the new heaven and the new earth. This is after the tribulation period. This is after the millennial kingdom. Revelation twenty one and twenty two describes uh, the destruction of the old earth, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. It also describes the new Jerusalem. Uh, it describes all of the saints there worshiping God. It describes Jesus Christ being there, right? And, and how, still, does, how does it? How does that passage depict God and Jesus Christ in that, in that new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem? Yeah, well, it, it, well, it depicts Jesus Christ still being in a human flesh, mm-hmm. in a human body. Mm-hmm. Um, he, remember, he took on that flesh, and it wasn't for temporary means. Mm-hmm. He he, re, he remains in that body. We would argue. So we'll see him. I, I, I just don't want to be disappointed in my understanding of seeing God. If he's invisible, is it possible? Well, I, I think Revelation 22 answers that question that God manifests himself in light. We're told in 21 and 22 that there is no sun, there's no moon, there's no stars, there's no yeah. need of those things because God's light, mm-hmm. his glory, he, he manifests himself in, in a way to be seen in light. I think you're, you. Am, am I right on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what you said wraps up perfectly. And I want to come back to what God says to Moses in Exodus 33 when Moses says, sure. Show me your glory. He says, But you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Right? Well, why? Because man, in our current state, we are so sinful. We are so separated from God. We are so uh, far into. Um, this depraved state that the holiness of God would consume us. Mm. But that eternal state that we long for, the, the Revelation 22 you described, will will include the future glorification that Paul talks about in Romans 8 when he says those who, who have been justified, they are also glorified. So we, we are justified in a moment, we are sanctified throughout the, the course of our lives, and we are ultimately glorified. And when that glorification and the new glorified body come to fruition, we are no longer uh, fighting against sin. We no longer have the effects of sin on our body. Mm-hmm. Death is no more. Death is defeated back in Revelation 20. And so now we can see the face of God and live. And that shows up through the manifestation of God and revealing himself as light. We, we see now partially, but then we shall know and see fully, Paul says in First Corinthians. Man, is that not worth, is that not worth fighting for Ab- here? Absolutely. And, and it, it gives us, we see, right now we only see the shadow. We see where God's hand has been, uh, for lack of a better term, his hand, right? But 
there's coming a day when we will get to see him. Mm. We will stand before him and we will look upon him and behold him. And the full manifestation of his glory will be in front of us. And we will, it will not be a question. We will be compelled to worship and we will know him in a way that we've never understood before. Even though we strive to know him and get a picture of that now, that, that day is coming when it's more fully um, just manifested to yeah. us. And until then, we want to maximize the opportunity that we have That's right. to know him. That's right. This side of eternity. Right. Okay, so the initiative, I cut you off there earlier. Yeah, and, and I'm kicking it back to you. Okay, what, kicking what, it back to me. Yeah, what, what, all that we've said, how do we, how do we take this? And I'm kicking it back to you because I'm still thinking. Um, so I hope you've got something figured out. What would be your big takeaway? After an hour of discussing the being of God, the names of God, uh, the appearance of God, why does this matter to me? Yeah, we, we want to let Scripture define who God is. That defines how we live. If we understand God correctly and we fully commit ourselves to the character and the nature and the being of God, what ought to flow out of us is humble submission hmm. and service and worship uh, for his honor and for his glory. Uh, again, as so many people have said, what we think about God, what we know about God, what we understand about God is really the most important thing about us because if we have a biblical perspective of the one true God and we're compelled to know him, we will be motivated and moved to live mm. for him. Yeah. And that's what essentially fuels everything. We, I mean, that's why we're here recording this. Right. That's why we're spending time uh, researching and studying and, and all, of, all of the work that goes behind the scenes to make God's name known mm -hmm. in a clear biblical way. Yeah, that's why we do theology proper. That's where our, our focus is. That's good. Man, my, my initiative, and I, I, I'm just I, I'm thinking about how I want to say this kindly and gently, but um, God is not a cartoon depiction of a white guy in a white robe with a beard and bald head and just this, man, this totally distorted view that that whether it's it's comical or whether it's blasphemous or whether it's a legitimate attempt to try to capture God, that's not who God is. And to try to encapsulate that with a, it's creating God in our own image. And um, yeah, where is that in Genesis one? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's not there. And even even some of the, the the famous paintings that depict you know God and man with God and that that's not what God looks like for one thing. But not just oh you you've colored him the wrong skin color. You, his hands should be bigger. That's not that's not it. That's not the distortion. The distortion is that God cannot be captured in an image because he is invisible. He is above all his name. He, he, he just is. He is Yahweh. And we can't fully grasp that image or that creation uh, or, or that being of God in, in some kind of physical image other than what God has given us in his word. And so I, I think if we're not careful, I think people subconsciously read and picture God sitting up on a a little throne on the clouds looking down just like it would be you know what I'm saying like I, I don't think that anybody does this on purpose but I think that's what subconsciously because of our culture because of our upbringing or because that's just all we know we picture God the wrong way and it, if we have a wrong viewpoint of who God is from the beginning we're going to miss so much about who he is and not be able to worship him appropriately yeah that's good yeah, yeah this bibliology or bibliology series connecting into the theology proper um now we're fired up. I think we'll actually have a couple guests on the horizon yes. that may come help us out yeah. on, on this series. Looking forward to um, that. So, yeah, it's going to be a good time. Well, if you're not doing so already, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, be sure to like us on Facebook at Reformed Informants, where you can send us any kind of message for anything you might want to ask. And you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at R underscore informants. Yeah, and if you have any questions or suggestions for topics of discussion, uh, feel free to email us at reformedinformants at gmail.com.